Hello, and thank you for joining us today for our webinar on mosquito management, turning key solutions and responsible control. I am Ayana Jones, a project coordinator for the National Environmental Health Association. And it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Brooks Bowes and Kelsey Renfro of Vector Disease Control International, or, v or VDCI, who will discuss the multiple steps required to implement a responsible emergency response mosquito management plan. This webinar will cover coordination with local, state, and federal governments, challenges with funding, as well as preparation and logistics. This webinar will include a facilitated question and answer at the end of Dr. Bowes and Kelsey's presentations. During the presentation, feel free to type in your questions in the chat box at the bottom right-hand side of um, your screen. Um, and so please note that this session is being recorded and the final recording will be upla uploaded on Taniha.org a week from today. And we will share links to the resources mentioned via uh, a follow-up email. So feel free to go ahead and type in your questions and we'll go ahead and answer them at the end of the presentation. So before we dive into our presentations, it's my honor to introduce Dr. Brooks Bowes, who is the Director of Research and Innovation for VDCI and currently serves on the board of the West Central Mosquito and Vector Control Association. After earning both a Master of Science degree and PhD in Biology, she discovered mosquitoes were her passion and started working in public health. As a specialist in emergency response and disaster relief efforts, she served as the on-site coordinator to both the Virgin Islands and Marshall Islands after the emergence of Zika virus in 2016. She also worked as the IPM manager for VDCI's hurricane response efforts in Florida after Hurricane Irma, Irma in 2017 and oversaw operational activities associated with Hurricane Harvey Irma, Florence, and Michael. I would also like to introduce Kelsey Renfro, who is the laboratory manager at BDCI. Uh, and she's located out of their Denver office. Kelsey holds a degree in biology with a minor in environmental science from the Metropolitan State University of Denver. She's certifi certified in mosquito identification. She's a certified mosquito identification specialist, special, specialist trained through the University of Florida Medical Entomology Laboratory. As a taxonomic expert, she can identify mosquitoes from Alaska to Puerto Rico and has been deployed to support multiple post-hurricane surveillance efforts. Kelsey's recent travel experiences include trips to Brazil, Panama, and Hawaii, working as a, uh, as a production assistant and taxonomics for Dr. Hancock's anticipated documentary series, Mosquito Man, Invasion of the Man Biters. We at NEHA greatly appreciate our partnership with VDCI and we are appreciative of Dr. Bowes and Kelsey's work and willingness to participate on this webinar. Uh, this information is extremely useful to our members who both uh, who work both in vector control and emergency response. Uh, so with that, I will go ahead and hand it over to you both. Dr. Bowes and Kelsey, go ahead and take it away. All right, thank you, Ayanna, and thank you to everyone for taking the time out of your day to join us. Um, as we're near the end of hurricane season and are thankful that we didn't have any major storms hit the United States this year. I think it's a good time to review how hurricanes affect our communities and how mosquitoes often become a very real and concerning factor in the aftermath of a storm. Not letting me progress the slide here. There we go. All right, so as you probably know, hurricane season typically lasts between the months of May and November. In 2019, there were a total of 16 named storms, which is on the high end of predicted averages. Fortunately, most of these storms were relatively weak and or did not make direct landfall, with the exception of Hurricane Dorian, who severely damaged the Bahamas, but only skimmed the coast of North Carolina, and tropical storm Humberto, who threatened Florida in early September, but ended up being a minor event. What the map image I have shown here highlights is the potential for things to get really bad really quick. At one point during the season, there were a total of six named storms, all brewing at the same time, which brings to life the real question here, which is, is your community prepared if an event like this were to hit your jurisdiction? Having some technical difficulties here. Can 
me put it back in presentation mode. It's not letting me. Anna, can you help me here with the, the viewing of the presentation? Yeah, Brooks, let me go ahead and take control of the screen one second. Sorry about this, guys. Can you pick it up from there? Not letting me. Looks like we're back. Okay. All right. So as environmental health specialists, you guys know that there's often a lot, or you're often pulled in a lot of different directions. And natural disasters like hurricanes tend to test your ability to manage all of these things. With the initial hit, you're dealing with down power lines, flooding, chemical spills, hazardous waste, and access to clean food or water. All of these things need to be dealt with immediately. Sorry about this, guys. It's Anna, do you have the ability to move between slides? Because I don't seem to. Okay, we're on the right slide. <laughs> okay. Yeah, Brooks, I'll go ahead and just tell me when to go next, and I'll go ahead and, and, and shuffle for you. Okay, I'm, it should be. Yeah, on the is your community prepared slide with all the different aspects of heater control. Am I going back? Yeah, it's the one that starts with is your community prepared? Somehow the order seems to be mixed up. One second. Is that right? Uh, the outline comes after is your community prepared. All right. Okay. So yeah, so so as I said, yeah, you're as environmental health specialist, you're trying to deal with all of these things, down power lines, hazardous waste, drinking water, mosquitoes, you know, all and most of these things need to be dealt with right away. It's when you get um, about two weeks later after the storm hits that mosquitoes become a very real problem. You know, they emerge in massive numbers, preventing linemen, insurance adjusters, and, and people supplying aid from being able to do their jobs. So what I want you to take away from this webinar in the end is that you're not alone in dealing with these issues and you don't have to deal with all of these things by yourself. So um, you can prepare your community ahead of time by working with neighboring communities and partnering with contractors like us that are happy to help. Next slide. So I want you to ask yourself, what percent of your current job description deals with mosquitoes on a regular basis? Now, do you have the staff and equipment that it takes to mount an appropriate response or to be better to contract that work out? While I can't see who all is online here, I'm guessing that the audience is quite diverse and that the capacity for mosquito control within your organizations is highly variable. So with that, I'd like to begin by talking about the foundations of mosquito control within the United States I'll then hand things over to Kelsey to discuss the tools and technology used in responsible surveillance and control. And then we'll conclude with a segment on emergency response, you know, securing funding, establishing partnerships, and hopefully answering questions that you might get in terms of environmental impact or um, control strategies and pesticide use. So, next slide. Looking back to when mosquito control really began, it wasn't until the 19th century that we really understood the importance of mosquitoes or, knew, or even knew that they were the vector of debilitating diseases like filariasis, malaria, yellow fever, or dengue. While current efforts in the U.S. are more focused on West Nile, Triple E, and Zika, these other diseases created the foundation of our programs, and it was soon after these discoveries that the American anti-mosquito movement began. The 20th century is often referred to as the mechanical era, in which ditches were dug by hands, habitats were completely modified to remove standing water, the middle of the century, up until the 70s, was dominated by chemical applications and indiscriminate use of pesticides blanketing communities. And then the modern era, which is now, really focuses on a more integrated approach 
which means utilizing all of the tools available to us and requires a full understanding of mosquito biology, which varies by species and geography. Next. As we look back to the early 1900s, we see that our country's first mosquito con control districts were formed between 1912 and 1915 to combat serious disease outbreaks in New Jersey, California, Florida, Utah, and Illinois. I think a lot of people don't consider diseases, mosquito-borne diseases, to be important in the United States because our mosquito control programs do such a good job. These disease outbreaks seem like a big thing of the past. The first aerial applications took place in 1925 to distribute Paris Green, which was an, an arsenite compound used as a larvicide against Anopheles mosquitoes, which vector malaria. Many people worked their way through the Great Depression by digging ditches and physically attempting to remove aquatic habitats for civil works or federal emergency relief federation. Despite the efforts of individual men, mosquitoes flourished and we saw that more than 125,000 malaria cases and people dying by the thousands. We quickly learned that wide area control was essential to an effective intervention. A man alone could not control mosquitoes. We needed better tools and intervention strategies. Because of that or with that, a lot of research and time went into developing chemicals to combat um, these winged beasts. In 1943, next slide, 1943, DDT was approved as a pesticide and used in indiscriminately for mosquito control in water, on crops, and from the air, which is how the chemical area got its name. Through a series of experimental trials, USDA researchers demonstrated DDT's phenomenal residual power in a series of tests. By May of 1945, the Orlando Laboratory and the Rockefeller Foundation launched a major experiment in Mexico showing that after only four treatments, malaria was essentially eradicated and larval populations dropped by 90%. When it comes to mosquito control, our country was extremely successful. And I say that with some hesitation, given that I'm talking to an environmental group. The establishment of the Air Force Aerial Spray Unit and the cooperative effort between 13 states ultimately read, led to the eradication of malaria and yellow fever, which has led to a, a better quality of life in our country. Unfortunately, at the time, we did not have the understanding of the effects of overapplication on non-target species or even human and environmental rights, which is something that we continue to combat today. By 1962, Rachel Carson had published Silent Spring, um, a document that brought to light a lot of the issues surrounding responsible control and use of pesticides throughout the country. Our insight continues to make our industry better every year, and um, because of this, a lot of changes have been made. Next slide. The current area, 1972 through the present day, is really focused on an integrated pest management approach. Um, this relies on an understanding of mosquito biology, a lot of research into new technologies, with schools like Rutgers and the Florida Medical Entomology Lab leading the way. Responsible programs know the peak activity of their target species, allowing control to happen at night when pollinators are active but other insects are not or when mosquitoes are active, but pollinators and other beneficial insects are not. We understand insecticide resistance so that we're not unnecessarily using pesticides without getting control. The discovery of biopesticides, such as BTI and Bacillus uh, sphericus, have allowed us to target mosquitoes before they take flight as adults and reduces the use of general insecticide. BTI is a pretty cool compound in that it affects only mosquitoes and black fly larvae and does not affect any of the beneficial or other insects in the water. Repellents have come, become increasingly effective, so people are empowered with the ability to provide personal protective measures, and new approaches and technologies for wide area control and water management are constantly changing the ways that we can do targeted applications utilizing ultra-low volume techniques. What's interesting about all this is that while we've made great advances in our understanding of mosquitoes and the technologies available, the foundational concepts of mosquito control have not really changed in 50 years. Next slide. In 2017, NACHO, which is the National Association of County and City Health Officials, defined both core and supplemental competencies around vector control. Their definition was compiled from a variety of sources, including both the CDC and the American Mosquito Control's documents on best practices. I'm really going to focus on the core competencies rather than the supplemental competencies here. So the five things necessary to be considered competent include routine surveillance so that you know what species are present, what time of year they're active, you know, when their peak activity is during the 24-hour day cycle. Using these, this data to, um, to direct your treatment decisions. 
um, looking at whether your community has the ability for larva siding, adult siding, or both. You know, do you have licensed applicators? Do you have trained staff? Do you know the, the places that you're targeting? And then, um, you know, do you have routine vector control activities of, of multiple varieties, you know, chemical, biological, source reduction, and environmental management? And lastly, but definitely not the least important, is looking at insecticide resistance. So do you know what chemicals are going to work and which ones won't? Next slide. Sadly, only 14% of respondents were considered competent, meaning that they have the capacity for all five core competencies. 84% um, of jurisdictions need improvement, meaning that they fail to perform one or more of the core competencies. Like I said, mainly this is insecticide resistance testing. Next slide. So I bring, I bring up those core competencies because these are also the things that FEMA is going to be looking for in order to allow emergency funds to be used for mosquito control. So on this slide, we have a document taken directly from FEMA's website on vector control. When looking at written requests for vector assistance, FEMA, in conjunction with your state officials and the CDC, are going to rely heavily on surveillance data. This is the baseline data that I discussed earlier and the importance of understanding what's normal for your community. In your request, they're going to want to see evidence of more disease-carrying mosquitoes, shown at the top, and or increased biting activity that's posing a threat to emergency workers. Um, usually when they're looking at more, they're looking at greater than what you've seen on the past three-year average. So they're looking for a pretty significant data set. Um, both of these things can be documented through the use of landing rates, the placement of baited CDC light traps, and the documentation of increased complaint calls. So, and as Ayana said, I've got Kelsey Rempro, who's the centralized laboratory manager for VDCI, and she's going to be discussing the pros and cons of these uh, surveillance tools and what we typically see following a storm. Take it away. Thanks, Brooks. Hi, everybody. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how we do surveillance in these types of situations. The most important thing to know is that most of the adult mosquitoes that were alive prior to the hurricane likely did not survive the extreme winds and rain. So the mass emergencies that we see about two weeks after an event were eggs laid in soil before the rains came through. Generally, these are floodwater and nuisance species belonging to the genera Aedes and Seraphora. The increase in water from heavy rain, overflowing rivers, tidal surges, and outdoor containers allows for dry eggs to become submerged in water. Although these mosquitoes are not vectors, extremely high populations of floodwater mosquitoes make it nearly impossible to leave your house or do anything outside. After a hurricane event, many people are spending time outside trying to clean up, rebuild their communities. So with no intervention, mosquito populations impede recovery and reconstruction activities. So this picture on the left is a picture of a man working after Hurricane Harvey, clearly covered in mosquitoes. And on the right is uh, from the inside of a woman's car after Hurricane Florence, and she was just trying to document all the mosquitoes swarming her car. Next, oh, there we go. So surveillance methods. Um, surveillance is important to do before we begin control and after we have treated an area. Pre-spray data gives us an idea of what species we are dealing with and in what numbers. This helps us determine what necessary control measures to take and which areas are seeing the highest populations. Post-spray data demonstrates the efficacy of our treatment. There are many different types of traps. However, we use CDC miniature light traps during hurricane surveillance because of their ability to collect a wide variety of species. We also supplement using landing rates and rely on phone calls from residents informing us of areas that are saturated with mosquitoes. So this is the landing rate protocol uh, taken straight from FEMA's website. Just to summarize, you'll want to find a spot where you suspect many mosquitoes will be. Once you've disturbed all the vegetation around you, stand still, count only the mosquitoes that land on the front of your leg. Count for about a minute when population is high and for about five minutes when the numbers are lower. Once you're done counting, you can create a mosquito landing rate. So for example, 20 mosquitoes in five minutes equals four mosquitoes per minute. All right, so light traps. Um, CDC light traps are an industry standard in adult mosquito surveillance. 
They're portable and can be utilized in a variety of ways, but the most common model uses dry ice as a carbon dioxide bait source. Mosquitoes attracted to the trap are drawn in at the top and forced downward by the fan into the collection net. Many species are active during the evening, therefore traps are typically deployed at dusk and collected after dawn the following day. These traps collect a wide variety of species because female mosquitoes are attracted by a respiration mimic. This makes them the ideal tool for hurricane surveillance so we can monitor the vast array of species. While dry ice is generally pretty easy to find, in a situation like this, it isn't always a piece of cake. The number of traps we set are determined by the size of the county, spray blocks, and are located in proximity to standing bodies of water, to residents, and we favor places with lots of harborage and vegetative cover. We often are limited by the condition of roads and private property. Many times public roads are damaged, especially if they're sand or dirt, trees have fallen down, Power lines are down, so access can be an issue for us. Uh, the photo on the bottom right is a picture of a trap after Hurricane Irma. All right, so after setting traps all evening, we wake up early and collect and bring the traps back to our makeshift lab to, ID to be identified. Setting up a taxonomy lab during a hurricane event is an informal endeavor. If we're lucky, we can set up in a hotel room. If your rooms aren't ready yet, you can set up a temporary lab in the hotel lobby, as shown on the bottom photo. Time is valuable during emergency events, so being dynamic and making things work is critical. We must work as quickly as possible to complete the identifications because the data dictates what kind of night our operations division will have that evening. They need to know what traps are low, which ones are high, what species are where, and what de decisions to make based on these conclusions. So the table on the right hand side demonstrates the species abundance and diversity in three counties after Hurricane Florence in North Carolina last year. As you can see, traps were very diverse. Uh, 32 species were collected. However, there were only a handful of dominant species uh, dictated by the red arrows, Aedes atlanticus, Informatus, Vexens, Culex salinarius, Culicida melanura, and Seraphora ferox. These species were the main source of the mosquito problem, so we used this data to target our control methods. So I'll hand it back over to Brooks and she'll discuss what comes after surveillance. All right, thanks, Kelsey. Uh, before we move away from that slide, actually, if we can go back, um, I'd like to point out that this figure is actually going to be published in the Journal of the American Mosquito Control Association Special Edition on hurricanes, which is expected to come out early next year. So um, given that we are looking at you know, five or six primary species, a hurricane response tends to differ from a general response in a more long-term program in that you're dealing with multiple species. So regular control is usually targeting just one species, whereas in hurricanes we're dealing with so many, the spray operations tend to take place throughout the entirety of an evening, um, usually from sunset to sunrise. So. Also, I want to brag on Kelsey a little bit. Um, you know, as Ayana said, she can identify mosquitoes from Puerto Rico to Alaska and does on a frequent basis. Um, it really keeps seeing interesting things interesting in our Denver lab when packages arrive. Um, it's kind of like a grown-up professional pen pal program where the postcard or letter is replaced with a box of dry ice and new mosquitoes to identify from a new location. So um, when she's not actually on the microscope identifying mosquitoes, you know, she's helping set up training programs and working with local communities to educate their staff to become more self-sufficient. So um, thank you, Kelsey. And with that, we'll move on to what happens after you gather surveillance data. So in your request um, for assistance from FEMA, you're going to want to know what, they're going to want to know what type of abatement measures you're proposing. I would suggest that this topic is something you can talk to your commissioners or decision makers about now, and have included in your response plan. Um, this is the area of your response that can be that you can be proactive on and make turnkey. So the three th things that you really want to take time to consider are what life stage of mosquito you're going to be targeting. You know we often get a lot of questions of why adult control versus larval. Um, what equipment you're going to be using, whether that's aerial versus ground wide area larvicide, and then what chemical you're going to be using, organophosphates versus pyrethroids. So the first issue. Um, larval versus adult control. I think it's safe to say that adult control is really the way to go in an emergency situation, but you need to be able to answer and justify why. So 
So the CDC states that interventions targeting larval stages of the mosquito have been used effectively for decades, but the effectiveness for larvicide programs varies widely from species to species. In general, if habitats are large and amenable to environmental modification, like tidal surges or flood irrigation, the intervention is effective. But if habitats are small, widely dispersed, and transient, the intervention is less effective. So as Kelsey said, we often deal with a large variety of species, and the environments in which these species are found are also quite diverse and frequently changed or altered as a result of the storm. So it's almost impossible to get larvicide into each of those small habitats. In addition to this, the amount of product necessary for larval versus adult control is significant. You're looking at upwards of 10 pounds per acre for a granular larvicide, and it can be challenging to identify those habitats and, like I said, get it into those water sources. Um, for adult control, you're looking at approximately one ounce per acre, so a single plane or truck can treat a much larger zone. A freight vehicles are often hard to come by after a storm, so minimizing the amount of chemical that you're going to be using, or chemical or bio larvicides. In addition to that, you've also got to find a secure facility to store these pesticides and the products, so space is another issue to consider. All right. The next thing to consider is whether you're going to be using airplanes or trucks. To, to do the actual application. A lot of people tend to be afraid of low-flying aircraft, especially those putting out chemicals intended to kill insects. But what the general public often doesn't realize is that only about a sugar packet worth of product is used to cover an entire football field, and the droplets we use are significantly calibrated, or scientifically calibrated, to be smaller than a human hair, which will impinge on a mosquito, but not other insects. Again, another way in which we can be environmentally friendly is by targeting just mosquitoes and not other organisms. So aerial control tar tends to be more effective than ground because you can treat larger areas more quickly and you're not limited by road closure or access to private property. Utilizing equal manpower, as you can see on the screen here, um, a single plane with two individuals can treat an average of 40 to 50,000 acres per night, whereas a single truck, usually with a driver and an observer, can only treat 80 to 90 miles, which is the equivalent of 3,000-ish acres. This isn't to say that trucks don't play a critical role in emergency response, because they do. But given the limitations in housing and available staff working, efficiency is essential. On the bottom of the screen, we've got some statistics from Hurricane Irma in Florida in 2017. In addition to treating 1.7 million acres by airplane, we also treated about 75,000 acres by truck. Some communities opt for truck applications as a supplement to aerial because certain communities have fear regarding those low-flying aircraft. The vegetative cover in some areas can be so thick that it prevents the penetration of the pesticide into the target zone of mosquito flight activity. And sometimes funding issues are an issue given that you know, airplanes do tend to cost more to operate than truck. A little bit more about aerial versus ground. Um, I often find that people believe the exposure is going to be much greater from an airplane versus a truck, but this just isn't true. Um, both strategies are using the same amount of product per acre and using those specialized ultra low volume atomizers. So you should be getting even coverage throughout the spray block with both pieces of equipment. But given that road access, you tend to have you know, less even coverage with a truck. To reduce concerns about exposure, the CDC did a study looking at urine metabolites and people exposed to mosquito sprays across three different states. So in 2002 and 2003, in Mississippi, North Carolina, and Virginia, they, they had um, people go to the doctors and look at, look at these metabolites. What they found was that ULV applications in mosquito control did not result in substantial pesticide exposure, and that the concentrations of NALID, permethrin, and ephenethrin used during emergency ULV are too low to cause important human exposure. So if your community is you know, concerned about exposure, I think this is a good reference to, to have on hand um, to answer those questions. The last thing to consider is which pesticide is gonna be used. Um, this can also become a very heated topic. Next slide. So public health pesticides are really, limited to two classes or modes of action, um, organophosphates and pyrethroids. In choosing a pesticide, I would suggest that the most important question is what's going to work on your local mosquitoes, um, versus, you know, and so it's important to take emotion out of this. And both classes of chemical are used in agriculture, so even if you don't have regular mosquito control operations in your community, it's possible that your mosquitoes do have resistance, their exposure from other sources. 
Um, the CDC bottle bioassay is probably the quickest and easiest way to know which chemical is going to work without trial and error in an emergency situation. So to do a CDC bio bottle assay, local mosquitoes are usually collected either as larvae reared to adults and then put in a bottle with a known amount of active ingredient. Um, because collecting mosquitoes for these trials can be a little bit challenging, it's something that needs to be long before a disaster. And ideally, it's done on an annual basis so that you can track changes and, and see if there's any differences in your community over time. Next slide. So once all these decisions about what type of application you're using, what pesticide you're using, and how um, your emergency response plan is going to be put into place, um, for, for many of you, putting a mosquito action plan into place can be as simple as having a contingency contract um, in place. For us, it means taking care of all the details, being the boots on the ground, you know, calibrating equipment, setting up the lab. The first phase of our emergency response involves pre-mission activities. FEMA requires maps of the proposed treatment area so that exclusion zones based on threatened or endangered species can be protected. The FAA requires a letter of authorization from the county or state agency um, approving control so that we as the contractor or the pilots can get congested area plans in place this can often take several weeks, so it's best to have that as part of your pre-planning mission, and it's something that we can take care of and get done, you know, up to a year in advance. Our pilots, you know, in order to ensure safety of the community and our staff, um, we pre-fly every zone during the daytime so that they know if there's any new cell phone towers or anything that's going to be in their way. You know, we usually fly at 300 feet, so given this low application height, it's important that they can see and know these errors and have those implemented into our GIS tracking system. Um, when we set up a local office, we find a place to store the product. Our surveillance teams are out setting traps and collecting that data so that we can change the application maps if necessary. And then once we've been given the go-ahead um, and weather permitting, you know, applications usually take place from sunset to sunrise. Um, Post-mission activities involve trapping again, you know, setting traps, IDing the mosquitoes, and then you know, mapping all those details as shown on the bottom right so you can see exactly where the pilots are. Um, the green dots on that are where the intended target zone of the, um, the control activities is to be, and the red is where we actually fly. So a lot of times given wind and how long it takes from pesticide to get from the airplane down to the ground, it can take, you know, 30 to 90 minutes and will often be offset by a mile or more. Next slide. So I just want to kind of leave you guys with a quote, um, planning prevents an emergency from becoming a disaster. So. Next slide, in summary, is that some of the things you can do now to make your response efforts more turnkey is gathering community stakeholders, making sure that everyone's on the same page, and if there's any resources, you can share amongst neighboring communities. Um, determining your management preferences and align those with local, state, and government organizations. In terms of making sure that you're practicing responsible control, uh, I can't stress enough how important it is to obtain that baseline data. It will make everything so much easier for not only requesting funds, but for the operator to, to provide good control. Um, contact, uh, conduct insecticide resistance monitoring and prepare public education materials, both on personal protective measures as well as community management efforts so that those can be sent out to the community as soon as you, you know that control activities are going to be taking place. So. Last uh, slide. With that, I'd like to remind you that while you may not be able to do everything, you can do something and we're here to help. So um, thank you again for your time. And if you have any questions, both Kelsey and I are available to take them now. And you can always visit our website, uh, vdci.net, with a special section on emergency response. Thank you, Dr. Bose, and thank you so much, Kelsey. Uh, we appreciate your, um, your time in um, putting this presentation together. Um, so for anybody who has questions, please feel free to uh, submit them in the Q&A box. Um, I'll start off with a question. Um, Dr. Bose, you mentioned the, um, the um, kind of given the timeline of um, mapping uh, of the, the entire mission, um, and one of the things that you mentioned is mapping. Um, how do you all go about mapping um, or prioritizing areas um, for, um, for spraying and for treatment? So usually the state will dictate who's going to get control first, and a lot of times that's based on when the requests were made. So usually they just go in a sequential time area. Um, most state agencies will also set a threshold for a certain number of mistakes 
mosquitoes. So in general, it tends to be a 25, 25 mosquitoes per trap night or not, and we can spray that zone. So if you set a trap somewhere and don't see that threshold met, then we'll readjust the spray zone to, to take out portions of that. We're also focusing on high population density areas versus more remote areas, given that this is where you're going to have the most effect in terms of um, protecting public health. That's great. Thank you. Uh, we got a question in from Jay Lawrence. Uh, Jay asks, are you exploring um, drone operations and your surveillance and control operations? Yes, we do. We have we do have several drones. Um, right now, we don't have any application drones. Most of our drones are used for surveillance activities that you can access, um, you know, visual line of sight for certain areas. Um, but right now, drones, given their minimal payload, and usually the maximum amount of larvicide they can hold is about 50 pounds. Um, we find that it's generally easier in most of the communities that we service to, to access by foot. But the drones are absolutely you know, becoming a way of the future, advancing, and, and we've got you know, various people looking into that. That's great, thank you. Um, one thing that you mentioned on the last slide, um, talking about the community engagement aspects, um, I know that this is you know, not really one portion that you all particularly work on, but um, how all do you um, engage with the community? Is it through other um, organizations? Is it through the public health um, agencies? Um, how all do you kind of get the information out to um, those in the community about, um, you know, uh, things that you all are doing in terms of treatment. Yeah, so, so public education is, is a component of every program we do, whether that's a full IPM program that we're operating throughout the year or an emergency response situation. A lot, a lot of times we work directly with the public information officers for, you know, state, city, or county governments that, so that they can help put the words out. Um, having things on websites and social media is definitely a good, good way. Um, if it's going to be an emergency response situation, a lot of times that'll be put out on the radio um, to help communicate to people. But I'd say social media and you know, public events tend to be good ways in general to get people that news. Okay, great. So we have another, um, actually I have a few questions in the chat box. I didn't realize this. So Carolina Torres uh, uh, asks, hi, I would like to know what was the effective, uh, what, was the, what was effective to reduce the populations of Sorophora mosquitoes recorded in North Carolina after the flooding event in 2018? So, so generally after hurricane events and, and major floods, Thing. Yeah, aerial control tends to be the best for, for getting control of these adult mosquitoes. Um, Sorophora tend to be daytime flying mosquitoes and often not seen as much in light traps. So a lot of times people use landing rates to assess this efficacy. And depending on the timing of the application, like I said, we can usually fly between sunset and sunrise. The closer we are to either one of those time periods, we tend to get better results. So the the effective knockdown tends to be anywhere from 50 to 80 percent using dibrome, which is our, our general standard for, for aerial applications. Um, but aerial t tends to be the best way to knock those populations down. Great, thank you. We have another question from Tom Viles. The recommended treatment procedure for Zika response has changed over the last few years. Do you know what is currently recommended? Uh, last he knew uh, it was the backpack spraying within 100 yards of the positive household alarm of dawn and dusk hours. Um, anything? To yeah, so, so Zika response is interesting given that this species of mosquito does not tend to travel very far. You know, about 100 yards is the flight range of this mosquito. So backpack spraying was re recommended as the, the primary methodology. We usually don't see um, invasive ADs isolated to just those 100 yards, um, but you would have increased measures around there. The, the major control strategy now is a much wider area application. So they've taken some of the um, backpack larviciding techniques and put it onto equipment like the A1 Mister or the Buffalo Turbine, which can target um, small containers. So 
you know, looking at the droplet size, you're trying to see what can drift into these areas, but usually they're increasing that out, out to about a half mile um, of the infected mosquito if that um, has been identified. So intensive larva sighting in those habitats in addition to adult control via truck or airplane, depending on how, how much viral activity you're seeing. That's great, Dr. Bose. Thank you. Uh, we received a question from Michael Miles uh, talking about the public ed education. Um, he asks, what barriers do you, do you experience in public education? I think the barrier, the biggest barrier in public education is misinformation. Um, a lot of people will look up information about the pesticides in general or read the label specifically without understanding that the dose makes the toxin. So I think it's one of the biggest things that we can do. Um, you know, many of our pesticides are intended to kill insects, so, so they are toxic by definition. But when you look at the amount of exposure, you know, I think it's hard for people to understand that you know, we're using a sugar pack or less of an, than an ounce per acre. So, so given that the dose is so small in general, you don't tend to see those public health aspects. Um, so, so I think yeah, making, helping people understand that mosquito control technology is extremely different than what you're seeing in agriculture. Um, you know, also letting people know that 94% you know, of the pesticides in our country are used in agriculture. You know, so, so there's 6% that are used from households and in public health. So I think mosquito control tends to get lumped in with agriculture and just you know, getting that information out, whether that's you know, talking to school that they can take that information home, going to concert series, um, helping people become aware when it's not a panicked situation. The more we can get it out there, the better. Yeah, and I think uh, Michael actually kind of <laughs> asked the follow-up question to that. Do you observe challenges in behavior change of residents in respect to control measures? I think you touched on that just a little bit. Um, yeah, I think, I guess I'm not really sure. In terms of behavioral changes, you know, we don't necessarily see people, you know, changing their behavior in terms of using personal protective repellent, which is a frequent thing that we're trying to get. Um, I, do, I do think that when people hear aerial control is happening, um, they, they tend to get riled up and get, get nervous about the application because they don't understand the safety. So I think in terms of messaging that aerial control will be used for mosquito control or that any mosquito control measures are going to be taken, it's really important to cite the you know, the safety, the, the human exposure risk, the, the non-target aspects of it. So I think when we put that in our public, um, in our, uh, in our public notice, I think that tends to help, you know, give people some references that they can, they can see. So, you know, most people tend to calm down when they see that it can be done in a responsible fashion and that the next morning when they wake up, you know, there's still, there's still butterflies and bees flying around. That's great, thank you. Um, and thank you all for your questions. We have another question from Carolina again. Um, other than the AMCA, uh, which is the American Mosquito Control Association, um, other than the annual meeting and its regional meetings, what other ways are there to create networks of people interested in the subject? Um, and are there any out there that you recommend or support? Um, definitely the AMCA and their regional meetings, but I think, you know, NEHA, NHO, and, and the CDC have done a great job of, of getting people, of bringing together interested parties. I think to your local health department, whether that's, you know, in public health or environmental health, you know, talking to, to local beekeepers. Um, I think you're working with, like I said, schools and elementary school children, they tend to get, you know, pretty excited about looking at the different life cycles. But I think a lot of changes. You know, since 2016 with Zika, that there are a lot more organizations. I know, um, you know, NEHA put together the Vector Control Committee in 2017. So I think just, you know, talking to the, to the various parties and, and seeing within your community who's interested in what their, you know, their stake control would be. That's great. So we have another question uh, from Daniel Barker. Has there been any success with biological control, such as introducing uh, natural predator predators? Yes, so biological controls, I guess BTI is a type of biological control. It's a soil bacteria, and that's kind of the most standard introduction. I'm guessing you're thinking more, um, more large 
animals. So fish tend to be a good control methodology. There's a lot of regulations in terms of being able to introduce fish into habitats. So fish are often used in, um, in enclosed habitats, you know, abandoned swimming pools in people's backyards. Sometimes they're used in ditches if these ditches don't flow into major waterways and you can use a native species. Um, fish tends to be the best introduction of a biological control, but even that sometimes they'll outcompete each other and tend to die off, so they need to be introduced frequently. Um, you know, we get a lot of questions about bats um, and they really aren't a good control strategy. You know, in, a, in a lab setting, they can eat huge numbers of mosquitoes if that's their only food source, but in the wild, they're going to be going after larger, um, you know, larger food sources such as moths. Really not a good control strategy. <laughs> Some people have suggested putting out frogs. Again, they, they tend to use different habitats. So frogs need a much larger habitat than a mosquito would. And then in addition to fish, I think something that's important is that fish need a permanent water source, whereas mosquitoes only need a somewhat permanent water source. Mosquitoes take four to 10 days. So anytime they're standing water for four to 10 days, a mosquito can utilize that habitat, For most of the other predators cannot. That's awesome, thank you. Um, so it sounds like uh, we, or it looks like we've answered all of the questions that we have um, from the participants. Um, so we're going to go ahead and wrap up. I'll give you all back 10 minutes of your day. Um, but if you have any questions uh, that you can think of or that you think of a little bit later, please feel free to email uh, Dr. Bose and uh, Kelsey. Um, their contact information is listed here. Again, we're going to go ahead um, um, we're going to go ahead and, uh, I'm so sorry. Okay, so that, I think that's just a note to you, Dr. Bose, the last note from uh, uh, Michael Miles. Um, we're going to go ahead and close out. And um, again, thank you to Dr. Brooks Bose um, and Kelsey Renfro from BDCI. Thank you all to um, all of your uh, registrants and participants. And we'll go ahead and follow up uh, with a follow up email or send a follow up email later this week. Um, with the link to the webinar. So thank you all and um, have a great day. Thanks, you too. Thank you. Thank you.